Um, welcome all, everyone, to, uh, to the uh, live Monitor Farm debate that we're going to have uh, here this morning. Um, it's the Monitor Farm program, if you haven't been to a Monitor Farm meeting already, is all about the open exchange, honest exchange of ideas between farmer to farmer, and if we can bring in a, a scientist or a specialist to talk about a particular topic, then that's what we'll do. But the real value to you guys is the golden nuggets of information or even the bigger pieces of information that you can take home and try on your own farm. All in an independent and non-sales environment. One of the most popular topics, I guess, is crop establishment. And it won't have failed to you notice that we've got a classic piece of machinery here. It's the Betterson DD drill. And we wanted to find a, a seed drill that would get people's blood going and remember it with either passion one way or the other and uh, you're either very passionately in love with it or you absolutely hated the thing no till drilling it was all the rage in 1977 um it was all to do with fuel prices were way high that at uh, that time of, uh, in that period and um it cut cost dramatically of course you all know it didn't come without uh, without its problems um and used in the wrong conditions it was a slug trial maker um, it didn't really favour what very well was straw, um, and uh, really the straw burning ban was its death. So, we're all back now, we're, we're thinking that the plough is dead, they, th they thought the plough was dead in 1977, there's probably more no-till drills now on the, on the show stand there, than there ever has been. What makes us think we're going to do it now? What makes us think that uh, we, uh, we can reduce our tillage, reduce our costs, maintain yields and control weeds? grass weed and and the like and so one of the like I say one of the biggest topics at the monitor farm is crop establishment and we've got two farmers who have taken different approaches to the same uh, same issue I will say at this point it's not a, an either or you can't you don't need to decide between one system and the next if you're if you're plowing and you think that the power arrow drill combination and the plow is, is the ideal bulletproof way of, of going ahead that's fine, that's absolutely fine. We're not trying to push one, one way or the other, but it does want to make you think. And if you spend a lot of time thinking, this is just costing me too much, these, the Monitor Farm program can be very useful in, in finding those facts and figures to, uh, to, um, uh, to, to help you make those informed decisions and cut your costs and make you more resilient in the long term. Over to Tom. So anyway, many of you know I'm farming down in Essex and um, a few years ago I had the opportunity to do an upper scholarship and go off around the world. And I think before that I'd been thinking about our establishment systems, but during that Nuffield, um, a few things sort of changed for me. And number one, we've got to produce wheat on, at a world market price. I'm afraid we're not going to be selling wheat above that world market price, so one way or another we have to be competitive. Now, when we look at things, and particularly through our benchmarking that we've been doing with the AHDB, a lot of our variable costs are actually very, very similar, but our fixed costs range hugely. So for me, one of the areas of focus is actually on that fixed cost and how we can get our fixed costs down. Take that out of it, and I think we, more importantly than that, we've got the soil. And over the last 20 or 30 years, I don't think we've paid enough attention to what is our biggest asset. And so, we needed to look at ways of reducing costs and improving our soil management to hopefully produce a sustainable system going forwards. I'll give it to you that really we've got a broken system at the moment. Now any of you that haven't got black grass, I'd change pretty quickly because you're going to get it at some point in time. If you, if you think that by doing, carrying on doing what you're doing at the moment, you're not going to get it. I think what you see driving down the roads at the moment is an indication it's on its way. I was in Wiltshire just last weekend and I could not believe the amount of black grass I saw down that way, whereas two years ago you never used to see anything. We all know that East Anglia's got it, but it's spreading pretty damn quickly. So black grass is obviously one of our biggest challenges. And for me, that's where ultra-low disturbance drilling comes in. I'm not going to stand here and say we're only direct drilling, because direct drilling is part of it. We need to have the capability to direct drill, but we're also going to cultivate as and when we deem that we need to. Now that's not going to be every situation every year, but there will be some subsoil in, there might be a shallow tillage. But the ultra low disturbance part is incredibly important so that when we have created a stale seed bed, we're not then creating another whole flush of weed seeds to germinate when the crop germinates. Um, we're looking at the use of cover crops. Now I'd still say we're very much trialing this because this spring has been a hell of a tough spring where we've had cover crops. 
in the autumn we thought we'd got the job nailed, we'd got some cover, wonderful cover crops growing, we'd captured a lot of nutrients, some of them had captured nutrients to the value of over 100 pounds a hectare. But when we came to spraying them off, we've got so much to learn about when we spray them off, particularly on heavy ground. So we have met some challenges. I still wholeheartedly believe that to have a sustainable system, we need crops growing in the ground. We have one free energy source in agriculture. And for spring cropping, we're not using that for seven or eight months of the year, at least. So to create this sustainable system, we need to use as much of the sun as possible. And that means that growing cover crops, for me, is an integral part of it. They're stopping nutrient leaching, they're stopping soil erosion, they're trying to improve our organic matter and our soil structure, and they really are going to be a core part of it. But that's where we need help from the industry, and it's really good to see the AHDB is funding some work on soil and cover crops. And I think a lot of that has probably come out of the Monitor Farm program, that it's been such a hot topic of conversation over the last couple of years that they've actually realised that this is an area that needs research. Um, so then we... Having that sustainable system going forward is something that, uh, that is obviously a core to all of us and looking after soil. I also believe that longer term we might end up with legislation, which means that if we're growing spring crops, we have to have a, a cover crop growing. So our system really revolves around opportunistic threat, well, direct drilling wherever possible, with the use of cultivations where required to make sure that our soil is in the right structure for the crop. Cover crops. I believe in the future will continue, well, will be a very big part of what we're doing, but we're still trying to work out how and when we use them. And then, yeah, the ultra low disturbance in whatever system to minimise the amount of black grass or other weeds that we have germinating with the crop. We've also been able to reduce our machinery weights massively. So the quad track for us is gone, weighing 27, 28 tonnes. Um, that could be any big tractor. Um, and we've been able to replace that with a wheel tractor which weighs around 10 tonnes. So we're trying to get our machinery weights down. And we're working often with the drill, we're going to be working at angles. So for me, with lower machinery weights, I'm not convinced that we need to go down the controlled traffic farming route. Because I think that with less soil disturbance, hopefully with the growing crops and the cover crops, that, that isn't going to be, the, the compaction in the weedings and less weight isn't going to be something that we have a problem with. So we've been able to reduce our horsepower. And if the system ends up working, we'll be reducing our cost by about 65 pound a hectare. Uh, my name's Julian Gold. I'm the monitor farmer um, from Wantage in Oxfordshire. We ma I manage a Hendred Estate, just under 2,000 acres, silty clay loams over chalk. Um, they're the sort of heavy end of medium. Uh, we're trying to operate in a soil friendly, sort of sustainable way. We've got quite a nice diverse rotation. Um, and we're trying to farm in a way that's friendly to the soil. What our cultivation system is based around a three into one control traffic system 10 metres all the field operations and 30 metre tram line widths. Um, that's quite important, the three into one. I'll, I'll explain that later. Um, and this, this control traffic system, then we use that as a platform and that allows us to successfully operate a scratch tillage system, um, which is tillage with only tines. Um, an acronym that I use for it is SWAT farming, scratch with only tines. And that's our big objective. And why I said that it, the control traffic system allows us to successfully operate a scratch tillage system, I think that a lot of scratch tillage systems in the past have used discs which tend to move 100% of the soil surface and also they've tended to operate in s soils that are a bit too compacted whereas the control traffic system gives us uncompacted soil to work in. Why, why we do the scratch tillage system is down to going back to basics with what we're trying to do with cultivations. I think with cultivations you have to actually think there's two interactions going on. There's an interaction with the soil and there's interactions with the crop that you're about to plant. And thinking about the soil interactions, I think the most important thing with the cultivations, they've got to maintain or improve or um, definitely not detract from the health of the soil. And if you think about, in my mind, if you think about healthy soil, there's three factors really. I think soil biology, good levels of soil organic matter and good structure. And if you're thinking about soil biology and soil organic matter, it leads you towards a system where you don't want to do any deep inversion or deep loosening. We don't want to re-oxidize root carbon that's trapped in the soil and we don't want to disturb soil biology. So philosophically, I'm with Tom really on that. Direct drilling is almost the ultimate or very shallow scratch tilling um, to promote and maintain uh, soil health. The other thing is soil structure. 
and I think the best thing with structure is actually prevention is better than cure. So don't put the compaction there in the first place. Much simpler, cheaper than putting the compaction in and then taking it out again. So that's where the control traffic system comes in. The other interaction is with the crop. I think your cultivation um, operations have got to think about the interactions with the crop. What, what are we trying to do? We're trying to provide a, a situation where the seeds will um, grow well in the soil conditions. And also, if we can with the cultivations, if we can help with our crop protection, if we can help control weeds, pest diseases, it's just giving us a good head start and not relying on chemistry so much. And I think that the scratch tillage, um, we can make stale seed beds, which work effectively at the moment while we've still got glyphosate and we kill slugs which can be a big problem when there's a lot of trash we're, we're trying to return all our trash to the soil surface hopefully from this year we're going to 100% chop with winter barley and spring barley chopped as well as all the other crops so there's a big trash burden potentially a lot of slugs I can nearly with a 10 meter time cultivation I can nearly um, do that at the same price as a metaldehyde pass and I personally I think that's as good as a metaldehyde pass in slug destruction. Um, the final thing is I think that the scratch tillage it, it mineralizes a bit of N and when you've got these real high levels of high carbon material the crop's always going to struggle when it's getting away the soil biology is trying to break down the trash the, tro the crop's trying to grow as well so that little tickle of the topsoil and mineralization of a bit of N just gets everything going and the final thing is I think often on heavy land, particularly in the spring when it's wet, the complete direct drilling systems, you often see systems where disc drills have punched a slot into really quite poor soil conditions and it's not the most optimum situation for a seed to grow, whereas a little scratch with a tine dries out the surface in the seeding zone and just provides a slightly better tilth for everything to grow in. We've basically got a very simple 10 metre tine drill. We use that as a cultivator and behind the combine, make a stale seed bed and then turn around and use that as a drill. Um, so it's all fairly simple. Um, occasionally we have to use deeper cultivations. We have a range of um, tine cultivators ranging from a Weiberg with very light tines to a, all, they're all 10 meters wide, uh, ranging to a 10 meter hectavator, which has got quite strong tines, which we use to dry ground out in the spring. But it's all, along the same principles. We're not wanting to move 100% of the soil surface. We're wanting to effectively do this sort of, it's almost like micro um, strip tillage and almost have this battlement effect in the soil where there's areas of the soil that are untouched. That's pretty well the basics of the system. There's two good examples about t um, uh, tackling the same problem with two, uh, two entirely different uh, um, systems. So. There's only one out there. Tom's here, he can take a fair battering. Um, Julian's beside me. Um, what do you think? Do you think that they're heading to blackgrass oblivion or do you think they're gonna get on top of it? Do you think they've, they've got no problem at all? If blackgrass is more of a sort of wet soil plant, as we all know it is, when was the last time you did any drainage and what do you see as the under soil drainage responsibilities for blackgrass control? Is that something you're looking into or is it something that you say well actually we're better by killing it on top or should we be looking at killing it by not allowing it to have the conditions it thrives in? I'm over chalk so um, and with my control traffic system the drainage is pretty good um, and it's interesting I've got almost got the worst black grass um, I know the theory is that black grass thrives in damp soil conditions but our, we've got Ichneal series um, puffy soils up on the Ridgeway which are quite light and very dry there's about four inches of soil over chalk we've got they're probably our worst blackgrass fields so the blackgrass doesn't seem to be following the theory on our farm undoubtedly there's a link between heavy land and poor drainage and blackgrass um, and I, I think it's the probably the wisest investment that anyone can make on their farm it, it's very different when you're farming other people's land lake it, that is where it becomes a very very complicated subject because it's such a long-term payback that it, it really is down to each individual landowner and how they view that that investment and yeah you know, there's no doubt you get your money back but it's yeah it's down to individuals to make that decision somebody said you'd need to go to spring cropping to get uh, control of black grass well how resilient do you think your system is compared with julian's 
in terms of direct drilling on, on spring crops on, on heavy soils. Uh, I did mention we have cultivators and that we're not scared to use them and spring cropping I, for me at the moment a shallow cultivation in the autumn is probably still um, where we're not growing cover crops that's still going to be the most reliable. It doesn't need to be at 8 or 10 inches but just to give us something with a little bit of tilth um, I think in that situation it's incredibly useful. Tom, I think you're, you're, you're on heavy land, aren't you? Um, did you find that when you made this change, um, there, were, there were several years um, uh, taking a, a bit of a hit with a heavy land before some of the sort of things like the cover cropping uh, you know, changed the structure such that you weren't ending up with, with sort of lower yields? And, I mean, how did you find the first sort of part of your change? We're still in the first part of our change. <laughs> how are you finding um, it? I'll be honest with you, actually some of our weeks look the best they've looked in years, but I put that down to something completely different to direct drilling. We didn't have the wet, we'd had three incredibly wet winters the last three years, but this year we haven't had that wetter winter. And so on heavy land, the crops haven't sat wet all winter, and I think whatever cultivation system we'd have used this year, the weeks would look well um, in general. On the wettest farms, yeah, they, they still don't look well where they have been waterlogged and there's been more rainfall, but that's all down to a drainage issue. And I, I there's talk about drops in yield and, and things like that. Um, I think any system's going to take a while to get the hang of, of how, it, how we use it. And um, I don't, yeah, direct drilling is no different to that. Um, what are we going to see? Well, this year, I think our best weeks will be better than they have been for a few years. Our worst weeks will be as bad as they have been, like, as in no worse, but they'll, they'll still be poor. How um, can you subsoil it? I think you can't say we subsoil once every five years or once every seven years because then you build that into your rotation and if it doesn't need doing, then it doesn't need doing. If it's just a headland, then just subsoil a headland and we wish we'd subsoil a few headlands last year um, and that's part of the learning curve is knowing what we can and what we can't get away with but uh, one of the things I've explained to the people that we're farming for is, you know, let, let's be honest, the economics are tough. We have to somehow reduce our costs, otherwise we haven't got a business. And in working out what we can and what we can't do, we might get an odd field wrong, where we try and do too much, reduce our costs too far. But that's part of the learning curve. Now, if we can't have that learning curve, then we're, you know, unfortunately, it's a one-way street. We've got to learn somehow where we can reduce the costs and what we can do and, and what we can't do. Just a question really, Tom. Um, in what's been a tricky season for cover crops, especially this spring, some people have ventured in for the first time with it and, and found it incredibly difficult establishing. What's your sort of thoughts on what you maybe have seen in previous years? Um, is it a case of not sort of throwing the baby out of the bathwater, or you know, what have you sort of learned in those sort of two contrasting seasons where you know, last spring may have been a lot drier, for example? I think the machinery is definitely very important, but I guess what we've really learned is the spraying off for us in November on heavy land allows the soil to wet and dry, gets the wind to it, gets the sun to it and you end up with something more friable in the spring. Where the crop's been sprayed off in, I mean even, in, we sprayed a lot off in January, all of our, what I call it, all of our contract farms were sprayed off in January where we were trialling them there, and that was manageable. Where we've left it green right the way through to spring on the heavy land, there's been very, very little drying of the soil. And the slug burden on that has just been unbelievable. So. Um, to minimise the risk, I would suggest, actually, I, I would suggest Joe's got the best solution, which is grazing them. But if you don't have that capability, then I think the earlier you can spray them off, the better. And I'm not sure, you know, we all, we all think size is everything, but the bigger cover crops has caused, have caused us more problems with more, more residual, probably the surface not drying as well. And so I'm not sure that it's all about size. I think some of it is, you know, more to do with just having something growing. Is that working? Yeah. Um, we're experimenting with cover crops as well, and I've found that cover crops on our silty clay loams in the spring definitely don't grow, dry the ground out. Um, so we're just eating them all with sheep, and that, that works fantastically. We have a sheep flock, and um, they're all grazed. We, we've tried drilling into um, oil radish and things, and it, it's just way worse than leaving the fields bare. Tom. Um I was fit it right. I was just uh, wondering, going forward, how much you're going to treat your fields always the same, or will you will you move to more treating them specifically field, like headland to the rest of the field, and certainly field by field rather than just a blanket judgment. 
whatever system you're running. Now, you know, that in our system is, is low disturbance and running a subsoiler, but it may be a plow based system that still runs a subsoiler or whatever. It's about treating that part of the field for what it actually requires. And you're not telling me that the part of the field in the middle where there's been no traffic needs the same treatment as the part of the field where all the traffic's been, whether that be the gateway or so. It's about treating each part of the field as an individual and treating it and doing whatever is required for that bit of the field. Now that does make management more difficult because you can't just sit in an office and say, go off and do that field and that field and that field. That doesn't work. You have to be in there with a shovel or if, and, and digging a hole and working out what's required. Where do you see fertiliser placement having a role? Do you use it on your farm at the moment or is it something you're looking at or is it worth for us as a farming sort of people sitting here listening to you, would you recommend us doing it and what are you trying? We've thought about um, fertilising on the drill. We've actually, with our drill, because we're using it as a cultivator, um, sometimes when we're cultivating to make the star seed bed, we put DAP in the drill and drill the DAP um, before certain crops. Um, it's simple and it's cheap because there's no extra kit needed on the drill. But my personal view is if the, I think starter fertiliser is useful in early years of direct drilling and if soil conditions aren't good I think that if your soil conditions are good we've got very high organic matters, we've got good nutrient status we've got good structure, we've got nice tilth the crop's got everything going for it so uh, the crop grows, we get good yields I can't see the need to invest in expensive fertiliser equipment on drills in our system I think it depends on the crop and the situation but for me starter fertiliser is an insurance policy um, you can get it wrong without starter fertiliser, you probably won't get it wrong with starter fertiliser. You don't know whether the season's going to be challenging until the end of that season. So yeah, it's just part of the insurance and it's not going to cost you more, it's just placed. I'm a bit on the fence with uh, zero tillage and things at the moment, but I have got one field, about 15 hectares, which I haven't cultivated now for about five or six years, looking at methods of trying to establish crops without cultivating. And my biggest single problem is slugs. They tend to get under the trash, you can put some slug pellets on and, and I find it's a nightmare and it can be catastrophic the results. What, what are your thoughts on controlling slugs? Uh, slugs are a challenge. Um, I, I think that um, there's no denying, we, we have the ability if we want to replace slug pellets with the seed and I think in certain situations after oil seed rape it's again it's a risk management tool. I don't know very few people that are, are not using slug pellets after oil seed rape so I don't think it's necessarily more, it's just different and where we're placing them, when we're placing them. I think that slugs for me are the biggest threat to the system. It's not uh, black grass, it's, uh, brome isn't necessarily easy, but spring cropping sorts brome out to a large degree. Uh, but yeah, I think slugs are probably the biggest uh, one issue. I think this is where the um, scratch tillage scores. Um, if you think that you can do, I can do a, a 10 metre scratch tillage pass for between 15 and 20 pounds a hectare. So um, about, I think from last time I costed it, with application costs, about five kilos a hectare of metaldehyde is gonna cost you 15, just over pounds a hectare. So for the price of a slug pellet application, my post harvest cultivation is doing a similar job. We're admixing slug pellets with oilseed rape, which tends to get direct drilled after chopped wheat straw, and now it'll all get direct drilled after chopped wheat and chopped barley straw. Um, in the wheats, we're, most years we're just using one pass, um, about four kilos a hectare of metaldehyde in the wheats after rape, and that's usually it. Um, all the second wheats uh, don't tend to need any. So low level of slug pellet usage, and I think that's where the, the scratch tillage scores I, I think that flexibility is absolutely key and just to, to, to stand here and this is what i said to tim before the start of the debate really was i don't want to be here as a purist i'm direct drilling every acre because to me i think that's a one one way road and i don't think that's going to work out of all your cover crops uh, which are the ones you would recommend for us to try that don't grow too much top but give you some soil structure benefits and you know, have the least impact on spring drilling after them well, I'd like Paul Brown in the audience, really. I'd pass that over to him. But um, um, truthfully, I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Um, it, it's still very much a learning game. And 
Now, oats grow fantastic fibrous root systems, but then uh, that we've found that they leave it quite slotty afterwards because it's, they've got such a great root system that it nearly knots the soil together and you don't get any, any free tilt. Um, during the autumn, when I was, I, I was drilling some spring, green, spring bean after spring beans and it went absolutely perfectly. Same farm, field 300 yards away after oil seed rape. I went into that field and it was just like chalk and cheese. Same rainfall, you know, but just a different previous crop. And I'm slightly concerned with the amount of brassicas that are in a lot of these cover crops, that we end up with a soil structure much more gluey and like the, um, the brassica, the, the, the OSR stubble, than we do like the spring bean stubble. So that was one thing that came through my mind at that point in time. Do we need a lot more pulses in there? But then we're growing pulses in the rotation. But maybe vetch, I mean, vetch is one that people seem to get on with, but then you're looking at seed cost. And you know, it, it's, so at the moment, I, I think you can't beat having 10 different strips of a, of a load of different cover crops and just seeing what works on your farm. Basically, we've been talking about slugs, black grass. We've actually, on our farm, dropped oil seed rate. And because it wasn't viable in my, in my eyes, we were spending too much. Um, and we weren't getting the right returns. Have you altered your rotations for your systems? Are you looking to alter your systems? And Tom t touched on it about the cover crops, sort of with the brassica crossover. Are you worried about your rotation being narrowed because of the use of cover crops? We had a monitor farm meeting yesterday morning. It was interesting. And the big topic of conversation was rotations and black grass. Um, I think that I'm as guilty as a lot of other people that you've got used to growing big blocks of crops, fairly simple rotations, um, big heaps of um, product in big bulk grain stores. And I think that what we've got to do is, the black grass in our place isn't actually too bad at the moment. We've got a six year rotation with two spring break crops. But the message that um, came across yesterday from our meeting was that however diverse your rotation is, if it's fixed, black grass will eventually adapt to it. So. The thinking was that we've all got to be way more flexible, think on our feet, duck and dive, be much more random, and maybe my big bulk grain store with 1,000 tonne heaps needs to be 50 tonne bins, so I'm growing a bit of this, a bit of that. Um, and we're outsmarting black grass by keeping it guessing and growing crops that are drilled at different times. Um, the, going to the all seed rape one it was interesting. We had a bit of discussion about all seed rape. I mean, I think that all seed rape is still, still washes its face. Um, but I think that one of the problems with all seed rape is it hasn't been a good black grass cleaning crop for people. And particularly with our system, it's quite interesting. We're finding that where we're conditioning our wheelways and deep loosing our end headlands, um, the curb isn't working because the black grass is coming from too deep. So it sort of in, in some ways it vindicates to me this scratch tillage as a way of wearing out black grass and we think that now prior to all seed rape if we're not baling any straw we're not going to loosen any wheelways we're not going to loosen any end headlands and the whole field will just be 100 percent scratched so that all the black grass is germinating in the curb zone and we can just use all seed rape as a much better cleaning crop so i see a real firm place for rape still but we just need to manage it for black grass. I, I'd agree with all of that, Julian, about uh, OS, OSR, but the one thing you didn't mention is that uh, cabbage stem flea beetle. And uh, it frightens the living daylights out of me at the moment. Um, we've got two crops of rape where we are. Half of it looks fantastic and half of it looks terrible. And there's about 20 miles difference between the two. And some's on really heavy ground and some's on lighter ground. Flexibility of rotations, I think, is absolutely key because um, and, and that's one of the great things about having a, lot more, a lighter tractor and a smaller drill. When we had to take the quad track and the 8 metre Vilestat over from one farm to another farm, you wanted to drop, drill that block of land because it's such a hassle to take everything back there. Actually, when you can whip down there with a, you know, just with the drill to, fill to drill those last two fields, it's a lot less problematic. And I think that is a real plus to having some smaller machinery and, and smaller drills that you're not quite so reliant on block cropping to, um, uh, to keep things, uh, you know, keep your costs or, or just time um, efficient in that situation. Thank you very much. Thank you to both of you. Um, hopefully now, you, if you haven't been to a monitor farm meeting, you, you're getting the gist of the open conversation that we can have. You can ask those sticky questions that no one likes to ask, and you will get an honest answer and an honest opinion. And that's the, absolutely the value of, uh, of the monitor farm program. Thank you all very, very much for coming.